Welcome back. Our upcoming lecture will focus on the European health data space in the context of international regulations. Miguel de la Hoz has the ambition to save and improve lives by developing intelligent healthcare solutions. He's head of the Big Data Department at the Regional Ministry of Health of Southern Spain and works as a researcher at the Harvard MIT Division of Health Sciences and Technology. Together, um, Bart and he will share practical experience and he will talk about open data. And he's joining us live. Hello. Hi, how are you? Hello, Miguel. Hello. How are you? We can hear you Hello. and see you just fine. Welcome. Happy to be here. Um, greetings from Sevilla and thank you for having me today. Thank so, you, Miguel. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. So um, during my talk today, um, I'm going to try to set some light on how um, researchers around the world, like myself, are trying to democratize data. This is providing the engineers, the clinicians, and the and the rest of the, the team who is going to be interacting with the data, with the tools they need for providing better care and better value to, to their patients. We're gonna be going over the tools the patients are normally needing and over some success cases that we have um, experience in both the US and the European Union and have shown th that the democratization of data is possible in, in the European institutions. So let, let's focus initially a little bit on, on, on this very simple idea that should be clear at the end of the presentation. We are normally talking about artificial intelligence, about very fancy, very cutting edge methodologies that are helping us developing better tools, providing better answers to the clinicians in the shape of report, in the shape of um, publications in high impact journals. But, but there is something very important at the beginning that we need to have, and we need to have the data, we need to have the raw material that is going to allow us to, to build all these answers, to build all these tools, and, and to provide and improve the quality of life of our, of our citizens. So all the streamline, all the workflow needs to be very very optimized so so this can actually happen so we are going to be going over what what is, the, is it for research users and also if do healthcare providers can actually learn from from their data so for for that i would like to focus on the mit example on, on 2016, I had the pleasure of spending four years at the Laboratory for Computa Computational Physiology, a laboratory within MIT that is fostering open data initiatives and is actually making possible that other people do, do research and, and provide better value to the patients around, around this data. And the, the key idea of of the whole lab is Fissionet. Fissionet is this platform that was launched at the beginning of, of the 70s. And they, they actually foresaw the usefulness of establishing shared databases of, of ECG. This was the, the first version. And comparing algorithms for, for arrhythmia analysis. That, that was the first idea. But five years later, they released an open database that soon became the standard reference collection of its type. It started being used by 500 academic hospitals and industry researchers. So this Fissionet platform was established in 1999 through NIH funding 
and their ongoing mission is to conduct and catalyze the biomedical research and, and education. And actually, this is also helping decision makers to, to establish better strategies around, around, around the data whenever these open data philosophies are deployed. One, one of the most famous MIT initiatives is MIMIC. MIMIC is a database that constrains ICU ICU data, and the, the database allows any researcher from around the world to, to request this data and to access it in a secure environment. As you can see, in MIMIC, you can have vital signs, you can have laboratory data, you can have um, the diagnosis codes as well. And what, what they did is bringing all this data from the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, anonymizing it, uh, providing the, some data shifting as, as you can see here. And then not only building this MIMIC3 database that you can see here in the, in the green icon, but creating a whole community around it that, that is able to optimize and, and, and derive better and more insights from from this data so that that's why now almost well this is started in in 2008 so after all this year they were able to build a community around this data not only from the us of course but from europe and and other parts of, of the world because they didn't only release the data but they also provide the researchers with documentation portal, they, they, they provide the, the researcher with a platform to share the code for developing AI algorithms for mining and curating this data. And, and, and I think this is, this is the key, but this is, you could say, okay, but this is happening on the other side of the ocean. What, what is, what, what, how is this related to, to Europe and how can this help? Well, Mimic was based on the fair, principle, as you know, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And these are the principles that the European Union is encouraging any database within European soil to use when sharing their, their data. So, so the, the whole MIMIC strategy, a fissionet strategy was built under, was built on these principles. And the, the, my, my main point here is that we are talking about big data platforms. We are talking about data lakes. We are talking about data warehouse. How do we build this around healthcare data? I think we already have a, a pretty clear success case and, and deploying all this strategy within these principles, following these principles, would be pretty pretty straightforward. So that's that's how the Bostonian model had an impact on the rest of the world and in Europe. In order to foster open data initiatives and promote the creation of transparent algorithms, the MIT Critical Data Group is creating a data federation that will help address the, the reproducibility crisis. They, they will improve how predictive models are able to generalize regardless of where the data and the patient being treated is from. In particular here, I am trying to support Spanish institutions that, that, that try to, to democratize the use of their data. And this is, of course, a complex matter that needs to deal with standardization and, and legal regulation. In particular, in, in Spain, um, I'm the head of the big data of, of the Andalusian government. I'm trying to, to, to provoke a culture change within the administration. So we optimize the workflow to data and we improve the time to insights. I am also helping other open data initiatives taking place in, in Madrid or, or Catalonia because as I was saying before, if there is no data, the the AI is not happening at all. Um, 
the 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 present is looking pretty good because thanks to a good thing of the COVID pandemic was that some private institutions decided to open up their databases for research. This was the case of Sanitas or HM Hospitales. So this, this is really good because it's showing that healthcare institutions are able to democratize the use of their data because again, or we open up their, the, the, the databases or there is nothing happening. The whole streamline is failing and everything is going to collapse after this or it's not even going to start happening. So what, 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 what is normally what is going on when we digitalize a hospital? Today, we, there are already a few healthcare institutions and regions that have undertaken an almost total digitalization of their information systems. Among these pioneers, we can find regions such as the US with the Health Information Technology for Economic and Clinical Health that began in two, 2009 during Obama's term and invested million, they invested million of dollars to get uh, the US healthcare system to widely adopt standard-based electronic health information system including the electronic health records or, and, and in Europe, we have other examples in, in Finland and other Scandinavian countries. But after more than a decade of digitalization, they now have massive silos of healthcare data, islands of knowledge in the form of hospitals that do not interconnect with each other. Uh, th this means they lack interoperability. This makes these repositories not only burdensome, but also it leads to poor coordination of their patient care by healthcare professionals. So we don't only need to care about digitalizing our hospital, then we want the departments within the hospitals to be able to exchange information within them, but also we want the hospitals to be able to exchange information from one region to another. This is the case, for instance, in Andalusia, in, in higher, in, in southern Spain. And they were pioneer in, in interoperability. What, what does this mean? This means that all Andalusian hospitals are connected to each other and are not isolated from, from each other as in case, as we were saying, as is the case, as we were saying in most of the already digitalized region. This is the an enormously advantageous since it allows citizens not only to have their clinical data available, whatever they are in Andalusia, but also greatly accelerates the work of data analysis for researchers and data scientists like me as all the information is in the very same format, regardless of the hospitals or the health center we are exploring. So we are able to escalate pretty fast any data analysis from one hospital to the whole region. Trying to apply the MIT philosophy to the whole region is, is a challenge. The, the big data department that I lead um, is trying to make the most out of this 50 hospitals data in cooperation with the Andalusian Health Service and the Populational Health Database. And we are trying to use all this data coming from, as we were saying, 37 major hospitals and more than 1,000 primary care centers. And, and what, we, what we have here is that after two decades and a larger population than up to 30 European countries. Specifically, we could say it has a number of inhabitants similar to Switzerland, about 8.5 million. This figure, together with the patients who have been visiting Andalusia and those who are already passed away, adds up a cohort of more than 14 million patients. This data that we already have surpassed the vast majority of Western regions. There is also the, one of the biggest uh, picture archiving and communication system, the PACS of, of around 5 billion radiology images. But there is a still important work ahead when it comes 
to making the most out of this data in a strategy based on five fundamental pillars coming from the Laboratory for Computational Physiology philosophy. This would be security, integration, effectiveness, collaboration, and knowledge, because we don't all only need the data, we need to create community around it. So in terms of security, the, we need to be talking about K anonymization, which is a metric that allows us to state specifically how likely are we to re-identify a patient. So this is very useful when putting in, in the balance the, the trade-off for security and impact on the, on the population. The, this comes very, very handy. Also, instead of sending files with data to the researchers, the idea here is to allow them to access a cloud, a cloud integrated development environment so they can securely interact with the, with the data. In terms of integration, we want just one data point where, where they connect and they have access to all the different kind of data from within the region. So they don't need to be looking for pharmacy results with one data provider with about image analysis with other data provider. We want it to be integrated in a one single platform so we don't really confuse the researchers and we optimize the work they are doing. In terms of effectiveness, we want, as we were saying, to reduce the time to insights. And also we want to, uh, to, to automatize the regulatory and bureaucratic optimizations to operationalize the access flow. We, we want the researcher to have a very clear idea of what data can be used and how they can request it. And then the people providing the access should have a very clear idea of what is the goal of the project and whether it is ethical or not. So they can approve or deny access in a very fast way, because in the end, the, the researchers within, with, within Europe are, are losing days, weeks, or months of work just doing paperwork and waiting for the project to be approved. In terms of collaboration, as we were saying before, which is key here, we want a documentation portal, we want a code repository, and we need new platforms where researchers can share their publications and tools they built around this data so they are available for the whole community. And after this, we will be able to derive knowledge from all this data and create synergies between the group of, of the regions of the system. Always working, of course, in multidisciplinary teams with engineers, data scientists, but also clinicians and managers of the systems who, who have a very clear idea of what the unmet needs are. So because again, as we were saying before, we need better data to, to provide uh, our AI algorithms, our, our advanced statistic tools, because otherwise we won't be able to provide better answers to our decision makers, to our patients, and, and we won't be able to create reliable tools. So, Let's have a very clear idea here. In Europe, we can go fair, we can free our data, and we can make the most out of it. But but once we do that, let's not forget that we have been talking about cutting edge technologies here. We have been talking about prestigious institutions and revolutionary challenges, but something very important is missing. Only when we manage to learn to work as a team when the clinicians becomes a little bit of an engineer and the engineer becomes a little bit of a clinician, when we understand the importance of breaking down barriers to address clinical problems, only then will artificial intelligence achieve its true objective and generate value to improve the quality of life of our patients. Thank you very much. slide and I don't see you too much but I want to change it but um
thank you because a lot of the things you said um, were close to my heart because you used the words communities, uh, you used the word crowdsourcing, and you also work in the US and then you understand difference of cultures of collaboration uh, because there was, um, when you collaborate, um, 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 it's sometimes in each country quite different. Um, sometimes it's more horizontal, sometimes it's more vertical. Um, let me ask you a first question, because when you talk about research uh, making things accessible, um, when you talk about researchers, what do you mean, who is a researcher that should get access? Like, because I, I, I make it more clear, perhaps I clarify it more, because I differentiate between citizens' research, public research, and private research. And, and these are the three ones that could have access to data. Should all of three, perhaps I reformulate my question, should all of these three groups, citizen researchers or citizen scientists, um, public researchers and private research should get access to data? Well, yeah, yeah, that's a wonderful question. Thank you. Um, if we have a look at the MIT example, any researcher can can request access to Mimic through Fissionet. And in the end, no matter whether you're coming from the academia, whether you're coming from a private company, or whether you're coming to a, from a from a university or, or a pharmaceutical company, you if, if you're project your proposal is ethical you will be granted access to this data also we need to take into account that both the original institution where this data were extracted from the the Red israel deaconess medical center and the mit university they are both private institutions so if you ask me here for instance in in, in local data what what my opinion would be my my personal opinion would be that every every data request from whoever the, the the basic unit under any data request should be a data scientist and a clinician or manager from within the institution for for instance i think it could be much more beneficial for both sides including the private institution to have experts of the data on the data involved in the project from the beginning so if you are a private company and want to use the or 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 more than using the data you want to derive insights from this data you want an answer you want a result from mining this data i i would say the system should be providing a data scientist from within the institution and a clinician from the in, from the institution for guiding you through through the whole pro process because after mining data from so many different hospitals and and different healthcare systems what what i realize is that you need local expertise otherwise the data is useless because nobody's going to be able to properly document the data so you can use it independently if you don't belong to the system there are so many nuances in for instance now we're this this mimic database was built out of ehr electronic health record you need we 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 went while i was in the us we were talking about the clinicians working at beth israel we were talking about the nurses entering the and typing the information within the electronic health record because without them the the data is not that useful and and the conclusions you derive from this data are not that the and are not that the reliable yeah and, and and i hope you don't mind that i challenge a bit um this this of course. View because that's why um, we are private and and, and, and public institution yeah. yeah because the 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 demo, we talk about democratization, and and when you say like you have to be a data scientist, you have to be in an organization, that doesn't sound look like democratization. That sounds more like a, a, a kind of protectionist way to keep data within certain levels of organization. And I give you a counter example of um, your physionet. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with Open APS, 
the open pancreas um, system that um, was created by uh, a bunch of patients uh, starting 12 years ago uh, that were totally, completely unsatisfied with uh, the way how the closed loop medication systems of diabetics work. Like they had an insulin pump, they had their continuous blood sugar uh, measuring uh, devices. And they were um, like professionally, perhaps not a data scientist, but computer scientists, engineers, but doing something completely different um, in their, in their uh, professional work. But during their free time, because they were living with type one diabetes, uh, they started uh, hacking their tools. So they started um, getting access to the data that the insulin, uh, the continuous glucose monitor device was generating. They reverse engineer the insulin pump. Um, and then they started storing all the data generated by the devices on a shared cloud. Um, and then they used open source hardware to program a tool that uh, created their own algorithm. So 100% patient driven, 100% citizen science in that sense, because they didn't belong to any institution. They had a really strong personal drive. and. 10 years later, it took them quite a long time to, as you mentioned, creating a community around data. So they did it as values, Twitter, social media. Uh, they had a, a hashtag called, we are not waiting. They didn't want to use the in, wait for the industry to be finally ready with the device because their life quality um, wasn't really uh, well, like, well managed. Like the, they had hyper and hypoglycemias. And they said, this can be done better. But of course, they were not working in a regulatory environment. They were working as do-it-yourselvers, uh, hackers in, in the good word, in that sense, <coughs> not producing devices for others, but just improving their own life. And the amazing thing what happened is that their first results four years ago which were published by Dana Lewis, who was the uh, founder of, of the We Are Not Waiting movement, um, were extremely good. These people suddenly lived with, without hyper and hyperglycemias, and they're now doing a clinical trial based on that open source development. Um, this clinical trial is going well, and it reminds me out of the open source movements that first were laughed at by the industry, but suddenly they saw that citizen scientists, like we can call open source software developers at the beginning, perhaps citizen coders, um, that started collaborating using the internet, um, suddenly got embraced by the industry because this partnership of patients working together within the industry and scientists really started to work. And like when I read the uh, European health data space um, um, goals and I read what is written there, then there is written that um, support individuals to take control of their own health data. So when I read this, I read citizen scientists. I, I read that this should be open and it should, you should not belong to an organization to get access. Because I believe, especially for example, in a pandemic situation, one could do a data ton, invite 2000 people, to participate three days, and you would get much more results as having that embedded within one organization. Like, so I'm, I'm challenging a bit this thing because there are examples out of software, but now as well in, in healthcare, that show that democratizing is really democratizing, is not building barriers. Do you agree with this approach or like your personal opinion or I don't know how, how, yeah. how free you Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 totally, I totally agree. Democratizing is breaking down barriers, but this is what I am proposing here. The whole idea I've been I'm pitching is is totally, to, totally open if you compare it to any public healthcare institution within the European Union, because right now the governance process is so inefficient that it takes months in the best of the cases for accessing the data. I even, I even saw this myself in, in, in American hospitals. It would take 
months for for researchers and clinicians working within the hospitals to get IRB approved, to get to get a data file curated or less curated in the end. And I was I was both working at at Beth Israel and Massachusetts General, but at the same time collaborating physically at MIT there. And I could I could see even people not aware that only in a matter of of days they could get access to the whole data they were requesting from within their their hospital. So I think I I, I think these these steps need to be taken uh, slowly. And and one of the first thing should be democratizing access to data, the use of data, democratizing the use of data for researchers. This is the first thing that needs to, to happen. And, and uh, again, a researcher can, can come from many different locations and many different institutions. But what, what you were mentioning before, the people hacking the the device for monitoring glucose that's not the regular patient we, we 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 are repeating endlessly the data belongs to the patient the data belongs to the patient but we need to go farther because most of the patients are not hackers most of the patients are not data scientists and if my <laughs> if my if my relative 80 years old is uh, admitted to the icu and because data belongs to the patient they just hand them a pen drive with with their data. How how is that useful for them? How can they they make the most out of this data? There is there is just no way uh, that 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 these things can can happen with the, without experts in the in the process. And one one of the ways of of having some control in the in the loop in the chain of, of of data curation and deriving insights would be would be having data scientists that that know how the data was extracted and how the data um was was derived and and talking about the european health data space i think you're talking about because the european health data space is divided between my health at eu and health data at eu the users of my health at EU are the citizens. And the, the sentence you read is for interoperability in terms of primary use of the data. So the, city, the citizen can be traveling within the European Union, and if they get sick, they will have access to their data. So the, the clinician can, can uh, provide the, them with a better care. But for health data at EU, which is the secondary use of data, which is the project within the European health data space dedicated to research, the only focus coming uh, from the European Union right now is for researchers. Uh, again, I, I think this, this they, they mean any researcher. They, they don't mean um, healthcare institutions solely. It could be researchers from the industry uh, as, as they describe it. And, and also, yeah. again, you mentioned that out of a data done, we can have thousands of results and fancy solutions, but it, I, I really question the quality and reliability of these solutions. When I, after working as an engineer in a hospital institution for for more than a decade now is really complex. You really need to be within that hospital in particular understanding the pay, the problems that those clinicians have and those patients specifically have and 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 the the work needs to be really multidisciplinary from the very beginning and locally focused otherwise um we, we we've seen in covid you mentioned all these papers all these fancy algorithms but in the end very very few of them had a real clinical impact on the on the patient and I think it's it's a tough question, but like I, I I really have difficulties when we talk about democratization and don't give access to a citizen scientist not belonging to an institute, because you could argue that perhaps it's 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 a false analogy, but if um, if you look 500 years back when Gutenberg uh, released and democratized printing, um, he was having conversations with monks 
that told him, what are you going to do? Like, only monks can write the Bible and we should only write the Bible. And um, if people are allowed to write themselves, what is going to happen? Well, Luther wrote suddenly another Bible and we got the whole enlightenment. So I, I think it's really hard to see the future when you don't allow the future to happen. And and if you don't release this in the open, what are people scared of? If if the argument is that they can't produce anything sensible, well, then they can't produce anything sensible. But deciding for them that they cannot have access, that is not democratization. That is more, for me, protection of of what actually is is kind of kept um, closed in that sense. And so I, I'm challenging that a bit because I've seen in the coming from a software background, very similar arguments and discussions that always come back. Um, even the big search engine that we all use in the internet, perhaps not all, but most of them, argues or comes with uh, the term, we are um, democratizing access to information. But <laughs> that that is a very questionable phrase because they own all the information back, they own all the interactions and um, um, if you want to look into the algorithm nothing is democratized so that, that word democratization is easily used and in fair there is also accessible making it accessible but then there's not written who and who decides and I think we need to go um, one step further and, and uh, this differentiation that we make with patients only getting access to their primary data or primary use for the data for me comes too short. I think we should leverage the potential because in history it has shown that everybody was careful doing this, but eventually amazing things happen. And we see the same thing now with um, with Bloom and stable diffusion. Like there was a lot of arguments not opening these large language models or uh, stable diffusion, which is a, an open source DALI, what OpenAI used to have. And there was so much um, discussions like should we give the weight file of the algorithm to the public and they did and now what you have seen in the last two months since they have done this is amazing innovation things that normally people would have not thought of because people I believe in 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 the ingenuity from people and if you give them access and allow them things to do and not being paternalistic about well we should control it I think, I believe, amazing things will happen and, and and perhaps a lot of these things will not be useful, but not everybody who has access to writing writes useful books, Like, but we can all write. Like, Only the ones who really can write are the ones who spread their books and their word. Like, so I hope that, that um, I don't know if, if, if you can agree on this, but that, that we move towards that more open world, because I think it would offer much more innovation um, in that sense because it would cross-pollinate between different ideas, different backgrounds and, and diversity and diversity is always a driver for innovation. Are, are you yeah, opposing I mean, this? Uh, you, 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 described, you described it before, the democratizing is breaking down barriers, but I would add one step at a time. For instance, um, I'm trying that the um, I see you data coming from Andalusia based on the Mimic project is fully fully open because we've seen this is doable. The risk of re-identification apparently is not existing because after two almost two decades, there was no patient re-identified within this data set. There was no data breach scandal. And this is something, for instance, doable. Once we have pioneers. We, we can just replicate what, what we've done and, and follow these success cases. And, and for instance, the Andalusian ICU Society is trying to, to foster this initiative where all the data would be, will be de-identified and will be made open as, as the data in Mimic is, is open. But open doesn't mean without any governance at all. You, you could still... No, no. Protect these and have some uh, as 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 you 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 can add 
as many steps on the governance procedure and the requesting our, um, data process uh, as you need for making sure that this data won't be used with 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 a different um, perspective than just to provide better care or better diagnosis to the, to the patient like yeah. the mimic data is fully open but you need to to prove you 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 are a researcher you need to prove you understand the risk of dealing with this data doing a course you need to to pitch your idea of what the project you you want to do is about and 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 right now is that one of the most uh open uh, open project of, of healthcare data that, that that exists and most successful one uh, i think they they mentioned that 25 percent of any publications related to healthcare and machine learning has been done using the the mimic database and and they have i think twenty five thousand users so i think this is a good starting point of course you can you can always you can always improve it and in terms of um of of, of providing more data to the citizens and empower empowering them i i know my institution already allows the citizen to have all, all this data by by now patient patient by patient but i am sure uh we we will be building more platforms more dashboards so the citizen can have a better understanding of of their of their healthcare i i think that's that's coming mm -hmm. thank you I, I i totally agree on the governance and the anonymization or um, perhaps synthesization will become so good at making data available that that we we have much more data that we can give access to um, um citizen scientists as well um but and, um, and um, there is something very encouraging and hopeful in what you mentioned before the bloom uh stable diffusion i think all these transformers are really going to change the the way we we see data and and for instance the, the, there is there is so much complexity in not only standardizing your data but also um, making sense of already standardized data when you want to use it for research like the the structure of already standardized data are not that intuitive for for new researchers if we want more and more people to do research with the data and derive insights these these standards are not intuitive at all so maybe the, there is hope in these transformers that are being released and and from sometime from now we won't be relying on the standards because these transformers will be able to understand any data in any format and then automatically transform it to whatever format and whatever type you you need so i, I think there are really exciting things coming ahead yeah totally agree and not only the transformer but itself but the way how thousand people collaborated in the open and 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 created a governance model for these sort of collaborations and open sourcing even the models of collaboration and the methods that they used um, is there for replication so it will accelerate these sort of mass collaborations and but then to be able to do so you need access to data and not all of these are within institutions they are volunteers or um, hobby or uh, citizen scientists um, so I hope we will we will get there in 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 somehow I, I one remark I want to give is I learned that some of the data doesn't go out because some of the academical institutes work with the private industry to create IP out of the data and that's why they don't want to release it so I, mm -hmm. we are not naive there that that a lot of the data is not only about privacy but it's also because IP is being sold, and I don't say that this is the case in 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 Andalusia, but it is a case in other institutes that I'm aware of that there is a, a a governance to public research alliance that doesn't allow anybody to be part of this. So that's what I'm actually addressing. I mean, I, I haven't seen any any efficient governance models um, almost anywhere in in the world in terms of healthcare institutions. It's, it's a really sensible matter, but but it's coming through these open data initiatives are showing how 
how different you can, and how far you can get. So things are going to become more more democratized, not not totally democratized or totally one hundred percent open, but more and more open uh, in in the in the in the in the near future for for sure. And and to get to a democratized world, we need dialogues and conversations. So I'm really happy that you were part of this conversation today and. We will get uh, there, we will um, uh, create or expand the community we just started with this summit, but next year we're going to get much more people together. Uh, we had eight different European countries here. Uh, it's really important for me to mix different views out of Europe, because I think in Europe we have this unique culture and, and a diverse background, which also would perhaps uh, accelerate the innovation around healthcare. So I want to thank you for joining um, and uh, I hope thank to you. see you when I'm down there. Um, <laughs> I love your region um, and um, <laughs> yeah, good luck with all your project, Miguel. So thank you very much for joining and greetings from Berlin. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much, Miguel. Take care. Thank you.